from the member for Gippsland. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I congratulate the member for Pearce for her thoughtful contribution and insights you know, into this, this issue. And it's with pleasure that I join the debate in relation to the Rural Adjustment Amendment Bill for 2009. And the bill removes the current provision that a person might be reappointed on one occasion only to the National Rural Advisory Council or NRAC. And as all regional MPs will be aware, particularly in the uh, droughts which have affected many electorates, NRAC's main role is to provide advice on regional issues, particularly in relation to the assessment of for areas for drought exceptional circumstances support. This bill will allow for NRAC members to serve an additional term in the future, and I can understand the government's reason for moving in that direction. I want to make some general observations of my involvement with drought and NRAC as it relates to the Gippsland community this evening. And one of my first experiences upon entering federal politics a year ago uh, came about uh, through the need to strongly represent the interests of my community uh, as a result of the decision made by NRAC. Uh, on August 19th last year, uh, Deputy Speaker, without warning, without any explanation, I received a phone call from the Minister of Agriculture's office explaining to me that EC assistance for the Gippsland region would not be extended beyond September 30, 2008. And while I appreciate the effort by the Minister's office to make that contact with me, it did strike me as a bizarre decision at the time. And I, I quickly informed the, uh, the staff member that I thought a mistake had been made. In fact, I think the term was, I think you've made a blue. It set off a chain of events in the Gippsland electorate where I ended up writing to the Minister on more than 30 occasions representing the interests of individual landholders. Now, at the time, Deputy Speaker, the Minister accused me of playing politics with this particular issue, and nothing could have been further from the truth. And I accept that the Minister doesn't know me that well, but there was uh, never any intention to play politics with the lives of my constituents on such a, such a serious issue. The NRAC process had actually let down my farmers. The farmers were reporting conditions that were worse than the previous year, which obviously had, they been, were in receipt of EC uh, uh, funding and, and support. There was a complete erosion of confidence in the community as their cash reserves had been exhausted and many people were doubting their future on the land. Uh, the future of their children in particular of taking over the family farm was in jeopardy. This decision to withdraw EC funding at that particular time was the final straw for many of them. They had long suspected that there were some city-based MPs, and I dare I say it on both sides of the House, who really couldn't care about the plight of the farming sector, and this decision for them confirmed it. Deputy Speaker, in my short time in this place, it was one of the most difficult uh, jobs I'd had to undertake. And I listened carefully to the Minister for Riverina in her insightful contribution on this bill, and the passion that she exhibited and the emotional impact of the drought in her electorate was obvious in her, in her speech to the House this evening. It was an exceptional contribution by an exceptional local member. And just like the member for Riverina, I found the emotional toll of trying to assist my drought-affected farmers quite draining, but there was nothing in comparison to the turmoil that they were going through. It was made worse by this decision uh, by NRAC and by the minister to endorse the particular decision at the time. The uncertainty it created was terrible. Uh, visiting these drought-affected farms and telling them that, yes, their EC funding had been withdrawn, that we were fighting for it to be restored, but we had no idea whether we would bring the government to its senses in the future. The mood, the mood in the community was stressed, to say the very least. And the we I refer to, Deputy Speaker, was my electorate staff, who did a magnificent job to assist in the campaign uh, and that we were running at the time, and my local farmers, who, all, who also rallied to assist us. Uh, quite apart from the obvious economic impacts, droughts are insidious to the soul as they, as they sap away the energy and the enthusiasm of our communities and corrode, I believe, the hopes of the next generation. Uh, to see, and, and the member for Pearce referred to as well, to see uh, our big, strong farmers uh, reduced um, emotionally through the strain of uh, having to put down stock or having to constantly feed out stock if they're in a position to be able to afford to do so, and the constant drain they feel in dealing with these droughts is uh, emotionally gruelling for everyone in, in those communities. And the decision to withdraw EC funding in Gippsland was made after a desktop analysis by NRAC, by NRAC, there was no visit to Gippsland at the time, no attempt to assess the circumstances on the ground, and no effort to listen to the locals. And uh, I'm no farmer, Deputy Speaker, and I don't pretend at all to be an expert on the agricultural affairs or the uh, or practical land management issues. But Blind Freddie could tell the farmers could tell that the farms in my electorate were facing extraordinarily difficult conditions. These were exceptional circumstances in every sense of the word. Um, the Tambo Valley in particular, from Bruthen to Benambra and beyond, was suffering enormously, and conditions in the Buckland Valley were little better. And right across Gippsland, there were, there were tales of farming families doing it very tough. There were dams and creek beds that had never run dry in the living memory of the families of several generations who had experienced uh, farming on that land, and they were, they were faced with a water crisis. It was an extremely difficult situation, and in many instances, 
The conditions have actually improved now in parts of Gippsland. I'm happy to report that to the House. But the recovery does remain patchy and the EC assistance is still needed. And it's uh, one of the great challenges we face going forward is how we manage the transition from EC to sustainable and viable farms in the future. It is a, it is a challenge that exercises my mind and the mind of many others in Gippsland as our, our farming families, many of them have become uh, dependent on the income support that they do receive and our transition from now on uh, into the future is going to be very difficult for us. It did take um, uh, considerable time and effort. It placed a lot of stress on farming families to actually get NRAC to visit Gippsland and recommend an extension of the EC funding. And I commend the Minister in this case, and I know the Minister has copied a bit of a hiding here this evening, but I commend the Minister, acknowledge that he's, uh, once he came to appreciate the gravity of the situation in Gippsland, he did respond to the representations that were being made to him and he did uh, seek a further uh, on-ground assessment of the conditions in Gippsland. Uh, but such is, such is the inefficient system that we face at the moment that even once uh, NRAC had visited Gippsland and, um, and a ruling was made to return the EC uh, uh, provisions, there were some parts of the region which, that were actually excluded again. It's this, we had this bizarre situation where people who were separated by the width of a road were in very different circumstances in relation to the EC support. Uh, there were those who were in and those who were out uh, just by the, the 15 or 20 metre separation of a road reserve. And I quote from a letter from one of my constituents in Tarragon, and the letter was written on January 22nd this year when the Latrobe City was actually left out of the EC declaration, and I quote, uh, we cannot understand why some farms within the Gippsland region are able to access the EC benefits, yet we are not able to, even though our area in Gippsland is suffering drought. The EC declaration seems extremely unfair and inconsistent, as we are in just as much need of the financial assistance as our other drought-stricken farms in Gippsland that have obviously received rain. Deputy Speaker, that was typical of the pleas for help that I received from several of my constituents in, in the circumstance where some, some of my farmers were considered to be uh, uh, need, re requiring EC assistance while others were excluded, as I said, just by the width of a road. Um, there was, however, something of a breakthrough after the Black Saturday bushfires when the interim EC assistance was granted for those effective regions, but we await the NRAC findings on the longer term measures and I commend the Minister for taking those steps after, in the aftermath of the Black Saturday bushfires. It was a very stressful time already in Gippsland and every uh, effort was made uh, to accommodate the, the needs of the La Trobe city farmers in the, in the aftermath of that event uh, and I'm hopeful that uh, there will be a positive finding to continue support beyond the, uh, the current interim uh, support measures. Deputy, speakers, Deputy Speaker, it's interesting to note that on this occasion NRAC has actually visited the region to make its assessment and I would uh, commend that course of action for future assessments. Now, I give this, back, this background not to uh, particularly chastise the Minister or NRAC representative. In fact, I thank the NRAC um, board members for their service and willingness to do what I believe is a difficult and largely a thankless task. There is no enjoyment to be had in inspecting drought hit communities and I fully acknowledge the difficulty in uh, managing the EC arrangements going forward. But I, I do make my comments to highlight some of the failings of the current system, which has been changed from time to time by the, by the previous government, and it still doesn't meet our needs. Uh, the lines on the map methodology of ruling regions in or out of drought assistance has created many problems in Gippsland in just the past 10 months. And I accept the need for a better system, but it must be a better system for regional areas, not just better for the government to administer. And I take the minister on his word that there are no plans to pull the rug out from under farming families which are currently in receipt of EC assistant measures at the moment. But I also take the opportunity, Deputy Speaker, to put the minister on notice. If there are any steps that are taken to reduce the level of support or otherwise compromise the treatment of Australian farming families, he will face a battle beyond his wildest imagination. And again, I refer to the member for Riverina. And I invite the minister to view the tape of the member's contribution if he has any doubts about the passion uh, with which we and the Nationals will continue to represent the interests of farming families. Uh, the member for Riverina may be small in stature, Deputy Speaker, but she is a firebrand in her electorate and she will stand up for the needs of her community and those of all regional Australian families at every step of the way. The farming families of Australia deserve our support and I will stand shoulder to shoulder with them and other regional MPs to ensure that assistance is provided in the future when it's needed. The Minister has flagged in letters to me and in the public domain that he will be seeking to introduce a new system. And I stress, any new system needs to be fair. It needs to be equitable, and it must send a message to farming families across our nation that we won't abandon them. Deputy Speaker, the Minister has that opportunity to send that message to farming families. 
that he, this parliament and all who sit in this place won't abandon the farmers of Australia. We need to send that message loudly and we need to send it clearly. Our farmers need to know that this parliament respects the extraordinary contribution they have made to our nation's development and will continue to, to make to our nation's prosperity in the future. Australian farmers are world-class producers and they are selling their, project, their products into a corrupted world market. <clears throat> in many cases, there is no level playing field, but Australian farmers are consistently the best on ground. If there was a brown low medal for excellence in agricultural production, it would be awarded to the Australian farming sector year after year. Gippsland farmers are at the forefront with world-class wool producers, dairy farmers, beef farmers, horticulturists, the timber industry and many more. All these people are doing an extraordinary job in our community. And the member for Murray referred to the impact on the dairy industry of the corrupted world markets and the, uh, the, government's proposed, the, the impacts of the government's proposed emissions trading scheme. And I urge the minister to also engage with the dairy industry in Gippsland and beyond as our farmers deal with the current crisis they are facing. Farming families are the backbone of many regional communities and we need to help them prosper, not only to protect the food and fibre resources of our nation, but to support the social and the economic prosperity of communities across Australia. And I've spoken before in the House on this topic. And at that time, and again today, I'll deliberately refer to farming families and their communities, because when drought hits regional Australia, it hits us all. Uh, from those on the front line of our nation's diverse farming enterprises to the many small businesses which supply them. Uh, the teachers, the doctors, the health professionals often deal with some of the social consequences and the families themselves. Uh, when a drought hits a region, it hits every person within that region. And I think the member for Pearce put it uh, beautifully in her speech when she reflected on the, uh, the impact she saw in one of her early visits as a member of parliament. Uh, the drought is not a matter of odds and evens on the watering of the prized roses as it may be in the city. It hits the economic prosperity of the individual families in regional areas and their neighbours and the towns themselves. It has a dramatic effect on the social life of the community and the other often neglected issue of droughts is it affects the environment of the farms themselves and the broader, the broader environment of the region. Deputy Speaker, it's for those reasons <coughs> that there needs to be a long-term commitment for EC declared, area, declared areas to support the communities like Gippsland as they emerge into the recovery phase of the drought. And as I mentioned earlier, there are signs of recovery in Gippsland, although it is patchy at the moment. But it is an old truism that when it does rain, it won't be raining money. Or as the Shadow Minister put it uh, just the other day, it rains opportunity. And with that opportunity comes the prospect of possibly more debt as the, uh, as the farming sector invests in equipment, uh, in stock, uh, in, um, and in, in seed to, uh, to take the, take the next, next gamble, as it were. Uh, it does take time for our communities to recover, and there will be a lag time in that recovery process. And I urge the federal government to work in partnership with the state and local government agencies to, to continue to support communities throughout Australia as they emerge from this drought. And there is, there is a direct correlation, Deputy Speaker, between the, the length of years in drought and the community's capacity to recover, because during a, a drought, the regional areas suffer as, as we often lose skilled workers and many of the young people move on, literally, literally seeking greener pastures. And governments, I believe, have a, have a capacity to invest in the capacity of these regions uh, to help get them back on their feet. Um, money is going to be needed uh, as we emerge from these droughts for the on-farm works to assist in the fencing and basic maintenance, which a lot of this productivity-related activity has been, has been neglected um, during the, the period where uh, many of our farmers have, uh, have um, been suffering from reduced incomes. Our challenge into the future when we, when we address this issue of EC funding is to, is to support those viable farming families to help get them over the hump, knowing that on the other side they will prosper. Uh, this is not uh, a, an issue of welfare or charity. This is an investment in the future of our nation's productive farming enterprises. And on that point, I urge our farming families in, in the EC areas uh, to actually seek the information on whether they are qualified or entitled to receive assistance at the moment. I, I urge farmers not to self-assess, to actually don't take the view that this is some form of welfare if you access the income support or the interest rate subsidy. Uh, I've met with many of the uh, farming groups in my electorate over the past 12 months and I fear that many of the individuals are too proud to put their hands up for assistance and they don't realise that support is actually available to them. And it disappoints me that uh, at a time when we've seen governments at state and federal level, and not just the current governments, but seen go governments at state and federal level prepared to sm spend a small fortune on advertising and propaganda, that they fail to inform our farming families about the benefits which they may be able to access when it comes to EC assistance in their area. And I believe there's, there's, there is a place for reasonable government advertising to inform uh, the accountancy profession and the farmers themselves that they may be able to entitled to some form of assistance as they, as they deal with the, um, the impact of the drought. 
Uh, Deputy Speaker, I, I touched previously on the issue of the environment and, and the impact of, of droughts, and I want to return to that topic because it seems to be a bit of a favourite of the Minister himself. He just can't seem to talk about farming without firstly seeking to discredit the nationals and secondly to refer to climate change. <clears throat> I know the Minister is most pleased with himself when he stands up at the dispatch box and ridicules the nationals, but he does do a great disservice to the industry when he, when he, who, who he's meant to represent in this yeah. place. Um, when the Minister does engage in, in, in topics, so his main focus is always climate change. It's as if he's actually too scared to talk about agriculture itself, and it's uh, probably some sort of recognition that there are members on this side of the House who have actually forgotten more than he'll ever learn about the farming sector. And I want to make a few points in that regard, because I believe the Minister's obsession with always talking about climate change is counterproductive, counterproductive to his relationship with many in the farming sector. And at the risk of being seen to give the Minister relationship advice, may I suggest to him that he puts aside some of his sort of inner suburban obsessions uh, when he, whenever he moves out into the regional areas. Deputy Speaker, this government is responsible, I believe, for dividing Australians on the important issue of sustainable environmental management through its political approach to, to the issue of climate change. Now, by its, by its constant attacks on people who raise any concerns about the current CPRS legislation, it's driving a wedge between many regional Australians who are instinctively uncomfortable with some of the doomsday scenarios which the Prime Minister himself likes to propagate. The farmers and the rural landholders are the practical environmentalists of this nation. They have a vested interest in caring for the land and they are keen observers of the weather and the longer term climate patterns. Now, many of the farmers in my electorate have rainfall records dating back several decades. They know the land and the environment in their locality better than anyone else. They have been taking steps over many years to restore the land to balance. As each bit of research has come along, the most successful farmers have been those who have learnt more about managing the environment and the productivity of their land. They have actually embraced new technology. They have demonstrated their ability to be the early adapters. Uh, right throughout history, as they have learnt more, they have employed those practices on their land, and their land use improvements are constantly evolving. That is why any cuts to research funding are such a disaster for these agricultural industries. And the feedback I'm receiving in Gippsland is that the farmers are worried about the long-term drought and they're investigating different techniques and in investing in new ways to manage their properties going forward. But they're also telling me that there's nothing new, that farmers in Australia have always faced the challenge of growing our nation's food and fibre in a difficult and variable climate. That's not to say they don't believe the climate is changing, it's simply to make the point that they are innovative and they are able to adapt if they're not crushed by the heavy hand of government regulation. And it's in this context I urge the Minister to focus, on, to focus more on the things we can all agree on if we are to achieve a positive environmental outcome rather than pursue this political agenda to wedge people on either side of this climate change debate. And as I said, the farmers are the great practical environmentalists and there is an overwhelming support for sustainable environmental practices in my community, both in the context of the long years of drought and in the better seasons ahead. <clears throat> Deputy Speaker, in conclusion, I wanted to uh, refer briefly to the Productivity Commission's report into, the government, into uh, government drought support. And I do take up the comments uh, from the Shadow Minister in this place who described it as, I quote, the most ruthless thing that I've ever seen in any industry in, in my time. And it is a ruthless report, Deputy Speaker. The recommendations are quite scathing and amount to a complete gutting of the existing support programs. Recommendations such as EC interest rate subsidies should be terminated, EC small business income support should be terminated, EC relief payments should be replaced. All of this subject to what the report calls transition arrangements. It does amount to a root and branch overhaul of drought policy and it raises many serious issues which bear greater consideration at the appropriate time. Again, I urge the Minister to engage with leaders in the industry before he rushes to implement these recommendations. There are many wiser heads than mine, and dare I say it, wiser heads than the ministers when it comes to the practical application of agri agricultural policy across this nation. And I refer again to my earlier comments that there must be a strong message of support to the farming sector that its contribution to our nation is of value now and it will be similarly valued in the future. And I thank the House for the opportunity to speak on this bill and associated issues, and I wish the NRAC members well in their future deliberations.